I couldn't get this far last night, so I do think it's a Holy Spirit thing. Just give us the well, link. Come on again. Now we're not there. Well, I'm going to do that. Right. I do I don't want to do that. I Oh, yeah. I walked up with Tony then, sent me an email with me and I'm going to be in destination. Can't change life to destination as well as previous. Yeah, it's all I was here before. I just think my life was ever barely on. I'm going to do the network. Yeah. What I'm going to tell him is. So now that little. Oh, maybe the little side thing. Um, that little one. And it's red, which I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know anything about this. Okay, Vanessa. I am the least tech person in the world. No, I don't need the new one. All right, you guys can go, and I'm going to tell them it's recording, and that if we don't go live, they'll have it recorded because we figured out we're all recording. Okay. Okay. So you're going to go for it? Yeah, yes. Alright, I'm going to take this in. Oh, actually, I'm going to take this in. I might have to read it though like this. Oh, then let me do it. I'll just do it. Don't worry about it. Okay, everybody. Um, we are probably not going to go live. Maybe it'll work in a few minutes. But, but it is being recorded. But it is being recorded. So if you know someone who wants to see this, we'll give you the link to go on YouTube. But I do want to introduce Katie. Katie is so sweet to be here today. She just got back from India, so oh, wow. and she looks bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and ready to roll because this is her passion. So let me tell you a little bit about her. She is an LPC. She's also a registered play therapist, and she's a certified life education specialist, and she's an infant mental health specialist. So that'll tell you about her heart for learning and her heart for wanting, for loving on children, right? And she's attachment-oriented therapist. Lots of books down here that she brought for you guys to see, and you will definitely see that theme in there. And um, her approach is to provide trauma-informed services to families with addiction problems. She does EMDR. She gets involved with CPS issues and complicated attachment dynamics. So we are very blessed to have Katie here today. So I think we're going to learn a lot. Thanks, Katie. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so everything that she said. There are letters that <laughs> reflect some that somewhere. So I know it looks like alphabet soup, um, but the RPT is the registered play therapist, the CFLE is the certified family life educator, and the infant mental health is infant mental health endorsed at a level two. I'll briefly talk about that today, but there is a credentialing service on in infant mental health. There are four different levels, and each of the level corresponds with what type of work you do in the population. Um, so since I do direct practice, I'm a level two. Yeah. Are you okay? No, no you okay. go right ahead. <laughs> All right. And we're so, why wait? It's one of my things uh, that I get kind of frustrated a little bit in the play therapy world because all my play therapy training prepared us for, oh, you start at three, three and up, and you can find play therapists that do five and up. But what is happening in those first few years? Um, to me, we are missing a huge opportunity for critical healing in those first years. Um, and luckily, research supports that, um, developmental practices that have us implementing better therapeutic services at these age support it. We see huge transformation, and that's why it's definitely, as she said, something I'm passionate about. Um, I cannot tell you case after case of little infants with parents that have unhealthy attachment issues where I'm seeing actual abuse and neglect in front of me, and then through intervention and care, see a completely different outcome at the end. 
Um, so I work here at CRC as a child and family therapist, but that's, this is not really where I do most of my infant mental health work. Here I do typically see like two and up, um, but I also am a home visitor for Travis Family Drug Court, and that's where I get a lot of my CPS clients, uh, moms and dads struggling with substance abuse with a confirmed case of abuse or neglect. And then I'm working on healing in the relationship. Most of the children have been removed from their custody. Um, most of the time, those parents have also gone to rehab and there's been an attachment disruption as a separation. And so I'm then coming in and working on all those different components in the repair with attachment being the main lens and focus. Um, and then for the parent, really making sure I have that trauma-informed lens that I am seeing them for their whole self. Um, and what they bring to the table so that they know that I'm collaborating and that I really care about what happened to them as I am co-facilitating what's happening with their child. So why wait? There's no reason to wait. In fact, God didn't wait. He started with an infant. He um, could have done anything when you think about it. He could have brought himself to this world in any form, at any age. And more importantly than even the fact that he decided to bring himself to us as an infant is that most of the places in Scripture, he refers to Jesus as he is in the relationship, the son. So it's not just, I brought this person in. It's, I brought this person in the context of a relationship mm -hmm. and as an infant, which speaks to me about how important God sees our infancy, that he knew that there's something about being human that Jesus needed to experience from the start. And he also could have just said, bam, you're pregnant, nine months, you're born, but Mary had to go through gestation. So also speaking to that prenatal influence, that there is um, importance in what is developing along the way, that his timing, his patience, the care that was going in and the relationship that was forming is crucial. So we see from God, starting with an infant in relationship. So you probably maybe already noticed that I'm gonna talk fast. Um, because I am super passionate about infant mental health, I'm like, huh, so it's gonna feel like a fire hose. I've got lots to get through, um, but I hope that you will at least pick up little things along the way. There's obviously no way I can give a full educational topic in an hour. So you will also find that on quite a few of the slides, there is a link where you can find follow-up information. There are several videos I will not have time to show you, but there are links that you can go directly to that YouTube video and see it later. Um, so you can either email me and I'll send you the PowerPoint where then you can zoom in, you can see all the details, you can click on the links, or um, CCT has it and you can get it from them. So you can have access to all of it and more. So objectives, um, we're really gonna talk about infant mental health. We're gonna go a little <laughs> bit into development, not everything. Obviously, we're going to talk about trauma and what is it like to either be building resiliency in the relationships or to, unfortunately, um, be promoting tr more traumatic pain that can be going on in relationships. Um, and then we'll talk about the first three years of life and really seeing how that attachment relationship parallels with our spiritual development. For most of us, our idea of what a father might be comes from our early attachment relationships. And God reveals himself to us through lots of our times in development, but unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, many times through our direct relationships where we start to have a framework of what does it mean for someone to care for us? What is our worth? What is our value? Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. <coughs> so I want you to think about a relationship that feels loving. <laughs> think about what it feels like. Think about how you know it's love. And then just tell me some words that you would use to describe this relationship. Safe. Safe. Intimate. Intimate. Caring. Caring. Selfless. Selfless. Trust. 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 <coughs> Presence. Presence. Warm. Warm. Sacrificial. Sacrificial. Unconditional. Unconditional. Mm -hmm. So you probably have lots of other words floating around in your head and kind of hold on to that. That is your visceral response to what we're looking to try to achieve in relationships and in any infant mental health work. 
Um, it's hard to explain. We've come up with all those words, but I think if I were to put those words on a list and say, is this love? That most of you would feel like this, that's inadequate. That it's more than that. That there is this intangible piece. So I love this Winnie the Pooh quote where it says, how do you spell love? And Winnie the Pooh says, you don't spell it, you feel it. Mm -hmm. Because it really is more about a feeling. And so we know that we can say all these words, we can describe it, there's dictionaries, but what we're trying to attain in attachment relationships is this feeling, which does make it a little different than other types of work when you're talking about pre-verbal children. So what does God say about it? He says what matters most is love. So without having to read all the scripture, you all know this, it's at almost every wedding. Um, really understanding that he says all the rest does not matter if we do not have love. So he has ordained that our foundation is built on his love for us and then putting people in the world to love us for him, as him, uh, on earth. And so we know that love has to be the start of what is happening in our attachment relationships. So this is kind of a contextual framework um, when we're thinking about who we are, so I'm working with a family, there's an infant, the infant and the parent and the family system have all these different pieces that are coming into play. So I need to be assessing for the ecology of what's going on. I need to be looking for the epigenetics, biologically, what has been programmed, what has this family been through, what is the story that has been passed down, um, all the external factors that come into play, developmental milestones, how is a child progressing along, so in infant mental health work, just as in other work, you're constantly looking at several layers, looking at a family systems overview, and it's not only to define who we are and recognizing that part of attachment is someone developing their identity, but also showing us who God is. So a child growing up is receiving messages about who God is from all these same contexts. Um, whether they know it as God or caregiver or what love looks like um, depends on the family system, but from a Christian perspective, all of that starts to inform how we build our relationship with God in the beginning. So where do we start? Biology and epigenetics. So our genes influence us, and we influence our genes. So uh, from Psalms, one of the things I love is, this is definitely a, a favorite quote, especially when he talks about how we are intricately woven, uh, but really, staying on that foundation that God knew us before our beginning. So the fact that he goes through the time to really talk about, like when we were in secret, before we were even here, that he knew us, shows that being known, one, is important. So in our attachment relationships, we're needing to be known. Um, and then two, that God really had a plan from the start. Like I said, he didn't make us a blank state that at birth, is when everything begins. There's so much more to us than he knew us before how the um, <coughs> secular world would even say is our beginning. So intricately woven. Um, I was a pre-med student before in another life, and so I can get really geeked out on science and neurology and all this stuff. But uh, simple biology is we have a cell. Um, in the cell, there's a nucleus. In there, there's chromosomes. The chromosomes are made up of DNA. So you might remember this from your high school biology and college biology with the um, different structures making up DNA. And what we know now is that yes, your DNA is given to you at birth, but they're more aware of this concept of epigenetics, which is how that DNA is expressed. So you can have DNA that has programmed you to be a certain way, However, it doesn't absolutely have to be expressed that what is written in your DNA happens. So people talk about addiction being hereditary. Um, yes, you can have a uh, you know, predilection for addiction written in your DNA. However, there are other things that can happen in our environment that make it where that gene does not have to be expressed. So we think about it like a watch. My watch exists, I can see the time, but if I cover it, my watch is still there, however, it's methylated, is what you, so you've heard of myelination of nerves. Um, when it comes to DNA, it's methylated. Methylated, and means this gene, when the cell is going and replicating it, it's gonna skip over that part, and it's not gonna replicate that part. It's not gonna then make those cells say, do this addiction gene. 
Um, and that is what we do have control over, which is exciting. So although God has woven us intricately from the beginning, he has also ordained people, environment, healers to speak into our lives to help change some of that DNA as well. Um, so this is kind of interesting, but part of you began in your, great, in your grandmother's womb, which is um, interesting to really think about. And so when your grandmother was pregnant with your mother, your mother was already, when she was born, already had all the reproductive eggs that she was gonna have for her life. So you were developed in your grandmother's womb, half of you was, um, which speaks to the fact that some of your DNA is very highly influenced from that multi-generational factor. Before your mom even had an experience outside the womb, part of your coding was already in place. Um, and so we see this pop up in lots of different ways. In World War II, <coughs> Holland had the hunger winter. They couldn't get food into Holland. So moms were starving. They were eating roots. They were eating dirt, anything that they could. Um, and what they found is that when World War II ended, those women who were pregnant during that period of scarcity and World War II ended, and then there was a, a season of abundance where they were able to get what they needed and the moms were able to eat and the children were able to eat is that the children who were in the scarcity prenatal environment had higher rates of obesity, heart disease, um, cardiac issue, issues, cardiovascular issues. And what was kind of discovered was they were programmed prenatally for an environment of scarcity. And then they were born into wealth and abundance. And so their bodies <laughs> stayed programmed for what was the scarcity and they struggled. Um, same thing in 9-11. And when they went back and looked at moms who were pregnant in their third trimester, when the towers went down, women directly involved in that area, so not just my husband was there or whatever, but directly involved, um, when they went and looked at their DNA, they had precursors and markers for PTSD. They were also exhibiting the symptoms of PTSD. And after the children were born, when they looked at the DNA, they saw that, oh, here is this susceptibility to PTSD. So this is important to know because in infant mental health, especially a lot of the population I'm working with, um, PTSD is like a standard. <laughs> and multi-generations of PTSD is a standard. And so when I'm working with a baby and it's like, you, know, I can be thinking, oh, with my nieces or little kids I'm around, they just calm so easy. This is a different nervous system. This is a child that is being programmed for a different world. Now, I believe that God did this to prepare us, um, and I'll kind of get to that in a little bit, but, you know, there's reason for this. If you, uh, if your parent has experienced PTSD and you're born into it, but you are like kind of this naive, the world is great and wonderful, uh, my window of tolerance is huge, so I don't have awareness of danger in the world, you're more likely to get hurt and not survive. Mm -hmm. So it's very adaptive, um, it's very evolutionary for our survival. So uh, I love this part where, um, for behold, the sound of your greeting, when the sound mm. of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. So this is also to show that God has programmed us to feel emotions early on too. So <laughs> this is in there for a reason. You know, um, so many people like to think it's just like this little baby, but not only are they experiencing those DNA changes, but these young little ones are having feelings, they're having emotions. Anyone who has been pregnant can talk to you about how, you know, maybe they have a stress response and they feel a stress response in the little one, or they have excitement, or the sound of dad's voice and the little one wants to kick and push and do things. Um, so it's an interactive component of development that's already happening prenatally. This is why it's also important to do prenatal work, not just, so infant mental health work actually um, is, is prenatal and perinatal. Um, and then behavioral epigenetics. So the other piece that we see is that even when children are separated from their parents, where we think they've got no external influence on the nature and environment, you will see um, epigenetics in their behaviors come out in mannerisms, in um, facial cues, in tone of voice. Uh, and so it's amazing when you start looking at the adoption studies or like children who were separated from a twin and it's like they went into the same careers, they have some of the same interests. 
some of it is coming down to our biology. So we can't ignore it, it's all important. And also to note that it's not just the bad, I know I've been highlighting when there's been harm done and how that affects the DNA, but resilience also transpires through DNA. So as strengths and generations heal and get better, the DNA changes too. Uh, so one study that really um, confirmed this that I like because it's cute and it's animals and I'm an animal person <laughs> um, was an Ohio State rabbit study. They took four groups of rabbits and they bred them to be susceptible to cardiovascular disease. They were in four different campuses around the U.S. and um, they also fed them high fat, high sugar diets. So all of these rabbits should have <coughs> genetic environment equals cardiovascular disease. Well. That's not what happened in one of the groups. When they went in to study the four groups, one of the groups at Ohio State did not have cardiovascular disease, had the same genetic um, tuning, had the same environmental feeding. And so they went to go see what was going on here. And what they discovered was they, uh, these, this set of rabbits had a cage at waist height and the grad student that was in charge of the overnight shift watching the rabbits would get bored and would take them out and play with them. So he changed their epigenetics wow. with love and engagement and care and excitement and probably some delight in there um, and that animal having a different feeling. So there, everything was stacked against these poor bunnies and yet the resilience and God's ability to have us be part of his healing nature in life um, helped this one group of bunnies not have cardiovascular disease despite all the odds. The so the power of love. Mm -hmm. So that's to me what the what infant mental health in general is really speaking to is let's start early. Let's really get in with this DNA and let's start to restructure how it is expressed and mainly doing it through our care and our love. Um, so epigenetics speaks to a lot. So some of the environmental components. Um, this was a study that was done about oxytocin and looking in the brain. So you may, oh, I know I was just talking with a colleague yesterday, I just see depression all the time, younger and younger and younger. And it just startles me of like, what is happening in these kiddos that life isn't worth living? And you know, there's lots of components we could get into. However, if um, maybe there's some susceptibility from early on. So this is a study where they looked at moms with five month old babies playing with their children and they found that the moms who played more, who engaged, they had some specific components of play that were going on, um, helped to upregulate the oxytocin system, and that children who didn't get that um, had higher methylation. So instead of their body replicating oxytocin receptor, oxytocin receptor, yay, so we can really feel it, <laughs> their body methylated, higher methylation levels, um, and so then their body is able to absorb less oxytocin. They have less receptors available to experience oxytocin. So even if somebody is showing them love and care and affection, biologically what's happening in their brain isn't actually allowing them to receive it the same way that a child that maybe didn't have um, that interaction was. And so they also found they were more temperamental and less well balanced. So the simple act of play the simple engagement, relational um, connection becomes a mitigator for what I think kind of long-term depression and lots of other connection disorders. So a little bit more research. Um, in a NICU study, uh, they went in and found that when a baby was vocalizing, they were counting the number of vocalizations, they would vocalize more when their parents were present than anywhere else. Um, and that's from all other adults. So you've got NICU nurses, specialists who know how to engage with infant, yet that infant isn't as motivated to engage with someone who's not their parent. Uh, so this really speaks to how God designed us to have this innate connection to our biological parent. Now, I'm not gonna get into like the side, you know, tangents of adoption and some of those things that come up as a part of this, but just as base components, we are wired, and we're wired differently to be connected to our biological parents. So when babies cry, um, if I hear a baby cry and it's not my baby, my brain goes, oh, something's going on, maybe I'll respond. When they look at mom's brains when their own baby cries, they actually have a different level of stress response that helps to move that, that mom to go towards the baby. Um, and so the mom is more drawn biologically. Um, that also with the child, 
Dr. Brazelton, which you'll see in a little bit, a newborn infant, he'll hold up, and he has passed now, but um, he used to hold up little infants, newborn, just delivered, and he'd hold them up in front of their dads, and he'd say, let's both talk to them. And then they would, you know, oh, hey, little one. So Brazelton would be talking, and, the, and then he said 99.9% .9 of the time, the baby's head would go towards the dad, because it's the familiar voice. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to downplay the dad role in this, too. You'll hear a lot of mom because of birth and attachment, and that's where we're at right now. Um, but dads play a role, too. And then Brazelton said, like, if the baby wasn't going, just turn their head. Um, <laughs> just make it work to help that dad feel attached to us. Um, but what we know is that deep down what's actually happening is a, a rooted attachment. So God restores people. So this is where on this section of epigenetics in the fire hose um, and really thinking about our bio biology and our DNA, I feel like, you know, with Adam and Eve, maybe once upon a time there was this perfect DNA. Maybe everything was the way it needed to be. And then as generations have evolved, we've just gotten to lots of warped versions mm -hmm. uh, because of sin, because of our fallen nature, because of trauma, hurt, work, Satan, <coughs> so many different things. Um, but it is my belief that no matter what has happened to us in, along the way or what has happened to clients, that God is here to restore us. And uh, we think about in Exodus when he says, I'm the God who heals. Like he's not bringing diseases anymore. He is the God who heals. Um, and so my thought is we are also here. So in my day-to-day -day infamental health work, yes, I'm healing what's happening here, but I love to think that I'm like getting our DNA back to its origin. Like we're changing the epigenetics to go the opposite direction um, and really believing that God can restore us back to completion. Okay, so then shifting to ecology and development. So I'm not going to go into all of child development because that's <laughs> multiple courses. Um, but what happens to us influences our worldview. One of the things that God wants us to experience is to be known. Uh, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. He knew us. And so this is one of these foundational components in infant mental health is that it's more than just taking care of a baby and meeting these basic needs. It's really knowing who is this being. And when I'm working with parents, especially parents coming out of a lot of trauma, um, that is not an easy place for them to be. Uh, and so a lot of my work is then like, let's just look at this little one. What do you think they're thinking? Oh, what do you think they just noticed? Oh, look how he's really curious when you change your face, you know, and pointing these things out and then helping that parent identify what is unique about this precious being that's right here so that I'm not really just trying to form you into what I need. Like, unfortunately, a lot of the sleep training and Christian parenting books um, that just make my skin curl um, that really want a child to conform to what we need. God says, I knew you. And he is asking us, to how, do, how do you challenge yourself to get to know who this being is? Because I made them this way. They are here for a purpose with this specific combination of needs and wants and expressions. And so we have to challenge ourselves to help families see who is this precious being that's there. So one of the ways that God helped us develop in his infinite wisdom, um, and this is from Bruce Perry, and I'm not getting into Bruce Perry stuff, but... Uh, he's got great organization of the brain from the bottom up and the inside out. Uh, so when we're born, the main system that is developed is our brainstem. Um, that's why babies don't talk and say, hey, I need a diaper change. They cry. That fight, flight, freeze, that initial brainstem system is the main piece that's online. <laughs> then we start to see the limbic system and the emotional system start to come online, mainly around two. That's why you hear about the terrible twos and the toddlers. I used to be a toddler teacher, and so when a toddler would have a tantrum, I'd be like, yes, we're making new neural connections, <laughs> you know, and so you just have to kind of change your framework about it. Like, they're building a limbic system. This is awesome. If I can help them regulate this world, you know, maybe it won't be so bad later <laughs> when the world is actually really tough and it's not a world just about your blocks falling over. <laughs> um, so he, you know, simplified it where we can't have a fully functioning brain to begin with. You think about horses, horses are born, they can run on day one. We stay in infancy for quite a while. In fact, the first um, three months after birth and infant mental health world, we call it the fourth trimester, where we're really trying to encourage it being like this little neonatal um, relational time together. 
So another thing that's important, so out of Bruce Perry's work, he created the neurosequential model of therapeutics, and you can read all about this. But when he maps the brain and is trying to develop, so if he's with a four to five year old, and then he does an assessment, and instead of these lower brainstem areas being fully functioning, the way that his brain mapping system work, they're at a lower functioning or undeveloped. He talks about you've got to go back and do these primal things first. You're basically treating this child like an infant, building the blocks up because we can't get to self-control, um, you know, cognitive skills, critical thinking, unless we have these lower components in place. And so one of which being rocking, you know, I'm not teaching on his model. I wish I was trained in his model fully. Um, but in his model, he's really taking us back down. And so this is a little component of, we all need to know infant mental health because you've got that person in your office that needs to be held and rocked. And um, one of the luxuries about the work that I do um, in home visiting is that when I have the adults who need to be held and rocked, I say, you know what, today we're having our session at the park and we get on the swings and we swing in those swings like adults. And usually at first they're kind of like, Katie, this is silly. But next thing you know, it's like, whoa, their system gets regulated. They can talk to me about really traumatic things while staying really present and grounded. Um, so we all need to know infant mental health and we all need to know creative ways to really be scanning for what are some of those blocks that may have been missing. And how can I then start to meet your needs in those areas? Because we're not going to see proper development for what you should be at 35 until you've got this thing you needed at six months taken care of. <laughs> so the first things that come in to the brain um, in your first year of life, and this is the Center on Developing Child, a great resource for all things infant mental health. Uh, it's at Harvard. First year, one of the main pathways that's in place is our sensory pathways. So we have to understand brain development through the senses. Uh, we now have seven senses. Growing up, we were always taught we had five. Um, I wish I could talk about this all day too because this is one of my favorite things in problem solving treatment planning with kids is how am I engaging the different sensory systems. Um, but if you have not heard of proprioception or vestibulation, please look that up, get into it more because those are actually <coughs> my two main go-tos when it comes to co-regulation and um, brain de uh, development. So. We have all that sensory information coming in and it's being coded in the brain in synapses. So this is just a map of brain cells. As you see, um, we have some when we're born, but the brain is slowly developing. At two years, we actually have more than we do as an adult, but you'll notice that as an adult, they're thicker and bigger. And so it's that use it or lose it principle. Um, but it speaks to the fact that the foundations for where we get here are made very early on. And in fact, uh, your research kind of varies, but by three, 80 to 90% of the brain is fully developed. And so there's not a whole lot left. There is some of the pruning, some of the changing, there's plasticity, so there's hope. Um, however, these early years are important. So by the time that child gets to play therapy at three, we got a lot of stuff we have to rewire. And some of it we might not be able to rewire. So um, a little bit on how the brain wires. Um, this is Dr. Brazelton. Um, he talks about habituation. Now let's see if she does. See your legs move. And her arm moves. And her head moves. And she smiles. <laughs> Can you see her breathing? I could go on rattling for the rest of the day and she wouldn't respond because she's gotten into what, what I call a, a habituated sleep state. Okay, so I wish I could show you that whole video, but I, I left you the link. Um, so you'll see on all my videos, like I mentioned, there's a link, you can go watch all of it. Um, what he's talking about is initiating a startle response and that child starting to learn about their window of tolerance and is that sound safe or okay? And so that child is learning, I can really stay in a sleep state before my brain thinks that the sound of that noise is be scared or like shut down and goes into one of the other uh, more crisis management modes. Um, so kids who are young infants, even prenatally, who are exposed to a lot of trauma end up with a smaller window of tolerance. 
So um, in some of my home visiting work in years past, we did cortisol tests in the mouth. And we would do a cortisol test when we first started working with moms, and then we'd have our intervention and then after. And we would see stark differences before and after intervention. And one of the things we know is that cortisol passes the blood-brain barrier. So when a child is in utero and a mom's experiencing domestic violence, any kind of insecurity, food insecurity, financial insecurity, housing insecurity, um, any kind of stressor, as her cortisol level shoots up, the child is bathed in a higher cortisol level. So when that child is born, their baseline for stress is already altered from what an infant that isn't exposed to that cortisol is gonna be. So it's also when you've then got a mom who's delivering a baby the mom is a high state of stress because probably those stressors didn't go away at the birth. Um, and then you've got a baby that's got more irritability, is harder to soothe, has less of a window of tolerance before they're in a crisis mode because their baseline cortisol is already higher. Um, however, we know that with intervention, we can actually start to change those baselines. So it's really exciting to think that there's so much hope early on. Uh, where when you have the clients coming to you as adults and they've got barely any coping skills and their window of tolerance of what they can stand is just so minimal um, that maybe if there had been someone in early intervention, it could have a little bit more variability uh, and help them in life. So there's obviously a lot more to the window of tolerance, but as far as thinking about how it's influencing an infant, that's part of what's happening. And then co-regulation is the other part that helps to monitor that window of tolerance. So this is Dr. Brazelman. This is a newborn infant. Um, this is the day they're born. And what I'm watching right now is to see how she calms herself down. And she yawns, she brings her feet up, she pulls her hand up to her mouth. And what I'd like is to let her get a little upset and then see if she'll calm down to some of the things I can do. Isabella, what you fussing about? What you fussing about? That was so nice. You take your voice and calm right down. And so the regulation that we see in infancy is how does the baby handle coming from sleep to awake, coming back down again, staying under control in order to watch, to listen, to interact. And I think they're learning through sensitive adult handling how to put themselves together. Love Brazelton. Oh. Um, and I am a trained touch points presenter, and so you'll see a little bit of touch points. I do have authorization to talk about it, but not to, you won't find it in your slides because this isn't a touch points training. Um, but you can find that video on YouTube, so this is in your handout. What we saw there was that co regulation, and what we know is that children have to have somebody responding to them at first. So he kind of said in the beginning, we're gonna see how you calm yourself down. That's actually not quite how it happens with infants. And in the infant sleep controversy uh, world, it's really tough because you have so many people that say, let them cry it out, let them sleep. Um, you need to adjust to us if you're manipulating me, all of those things. In infant mental health, we don't find any of that to be true and research doesn't back any of that up. And when they actually look at um, brain scans and they hook babies up, what they're finding is that when the baby was crying themselves to sleep, they were moving from one stress activated stress state, which was fight, ah, help me, I can't do this, to freeze. And so in the brain, it still had the same brain activity of a stress state, but the external side had learned, nobody cares, no one's gonna respond, I'll just shut down. So what some parents think of as success, oh, my baby's quiet, they're sleeping, actually was having some mental health components where they recognize my voice doesn't matter. So there was one two-year-old I was working with. Mom had just gotten out of prison. She was a uh, drug dealer. Dad was nowhere to be found. Um, and first home visit, I go to see him. And 
he like walks by his mom and she flicks him. And I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. He walks by again, she pushes him over and he literally falls to the ground and he just gets back up and keeps going. No crying, no responding. And she's like, isn't it great? He's so tough, he doesn't respond. Oh, um, and so I'm like, all right, so. <laughs> and I can hear some of our worldview coming in. Um, but I will also challenge you to part of infant mental health work is like, why is that important to this mom? This mom's world, you need to be tough. You don't need yeah. to be sensitive. You've got to survive prison and drug dealers and whoever else. So she's trying to prepare him for the world that she has experienced. And so I'm coming in trying to say, wait, maybe you both can experience a different world. And so amazing work with her. She ended up having a subsequent baby. I worked with her for two years. And by the end, so loving and affectionate. But one of the things I loved, and it was a great course of treatment where like she, I was the awful white woman coming in, telling him what to do with the baby. You know, we went through all of it, right? So it's not all hunky-dory. Um, but two years later, She's at a different stable housing. She's um, getting her CNA for nursing. She did have HIV. She contracted HIV while I worked with her. So she had some other challenges. But um, child is walking along this like concrete thing, falls off, cries, and runs to mom. Oh. And I was literally like, thank you, God. Yeah. Because it was, here, look at this yeah. shift from yeah. day one wow. to two years later and where he is, and then seeing her with their little baby girl, and that she was changing the trajectory of what was happening. Um, so that co-regulation piece is really important. We're getting in that information that's um, coming through all those sensory pathways around us, and then it's informing our nervous system for how we go forward. Um, one of the ways that we're doing it is through neuroception. We don't have time to get into the full polyvagal <laughs> theory, um, but really good to know about porches and to recognize there's so many different components. For a long time, we focused on just the brain, but we really have a total mind, body, spirit system. God perfectly designed us to get input from all these different areas. And one of the things I love that's coming out in research now is the gut being one of the main sources of where um, different hormones and uh, norepinephrine and all kinds of things are actually created to go to our brain oxytocin. Um, so the gut is one of the places that we are actually cultivating quite a bit that goes to our brain. So this says, the capacity for self-soothing is born out of hundreds and hundreds of incidents of being soothed by someone else. Mm -hmm. So it's really like, yeah, it is really like that path. When we think about um, here in Texas, the deer path, and it was just this tiny little thing and then the cows followed and it got wider and then the you know um, uh, ranchers decided we'll take our horses on it and then the wagons and next thing you know houston's got five lane highways <laughs> and so it's really out of that repetition that then we recognize we can be more efficient we can get there faster and we can do this on our own that's exactly what happens with self-soothing so as we are laying those initial foundations with children of this is what it feels like to be heard and understanding oh man, we've changed your diaper, you've had sleep, I have no idea what's wrong, but I'm with you. Oh, this is hard, you know, even in that struggle of them really feeling like somebody is with me in this, they're building neural pathways that then make it, or later, hey, I know what it feels like to soothe, and then they can re uh, replicate it. Um, so stress response, if you didn't get that co-regulation, your brain begins to get wired for stress response. Hopefully you've all seen the hand model of the brain, Dan Siegel. Um, for kids, I call it the safety brain, feeling brain, thinking brain. Someone else came up with that and I use it too. Um, but really recognizing that when lids are flipped, and if you wanna see the video, there's the link, that we have to be that co-regulating force. And so when a child's lid is flipped, if our lid is flipping too, there's no safe, calm, stable person in the room, brain in the room. And so we have to have so much control over ourselves to then be able to co-regulate another. Um, so another component of infant mental health work is having myself regulated. Mm -hmm. um, I have certain scripture that I say before I have any session here, any session I have with anybody um, as my kind of affirmation and my grounding. Um, and then I'm also really aware of like, what do I need to leave at the door that I'm, so I am not taking it with me. 
um, and then making sure that my brain is able to co-regulate whatever is happening that comes into the room with me. Uh, ACEs study, also not going into the ACEs study, but ACEs study, Kaiser Permanente, Dr. Anda and Filetti, 17,000 initial in the study. Of course, there's been a ton more, um, but they really categorize 10 areas of early childhood experiences that we know change the brain and change the outcome of life long-term and their trajectory. One of the things I'll point out, since in this section we're talking about biology and ecology, um, is they, in continuous research, we've got the 10 ACEs, but they're also recognizing the adverse community environments and recognizing that all of those things influence it as well. So you might not have had some of those initial 10, but you could have some of these environmental components that then make it look like your ACE score is maybe higher than it was. Um, a way that we conceptualize it here at CRC is this emotional cup. And so as our experiences come in and leave us with certain feelings, um, certain cognitions, our cup is filled with kind of the good stuff or the yucky stuff. Um, and what we see coming out ends up being that symptom. And so if as a young infant, we have had a lot of tough things come in, you might be that toddler kicked out of preschool all the time, sent to the principal's office bedwetting, feces smearing, all kinds of different things that we see in early childhood. Um, and really it's recognizing that is some sort of a release that was, is just showing you a symptom. And a lot of times that behavior is actually a coping system. Uh, and so in infants, we're moving from state regulation. And if we recognize that a certain state of regulation helps us survive the world, sometimes it then becomes a trait of how we are. So states can become traits. Hopefully we are incorporating healthy states that we have where people are attuned and we're really self-aware. But if my way of survival has been that I need to freeze and shut down and not have a voice, then that might be somebody who later in life, that's a trait of what we think is their personality or who they are or how they engage in relationships because initially that was a state that help them survive and it becomes a trait that is a little harder to undo. So finally to attachment, uh, relationships and attachment. So I think one of the other things God wants for us is to be delighted in. And so those of you who know social, uh, Circle of Security, it's one of the main things that they talk about is like, oh, that being able to have someone delight in you. Um, it's also one of my favorite things. And so I love this part of scripture um, where basically it's speaking to women's labor and the anguish of it and then the fleetingness of that anguish when there's just pure joy. Uh, so I love both of these pictures as they're both newborn babies being held and I think both of those women are experiencing pure joy. But I also think God is teaching us about our attachment relationships. That there's pain, that there's joy, there's delight. Um, and that we need some capacity to transition between those things. And then also to figure out what is he saying about who we are in it and what is he saying about who he is in it. And so attachment, since we're in this attachment section, is very similar to then thinking about our parallel relationship with God. So just be filtering that as we're mainly talking about, you know, our human attachments, um, but recognizing that that colors a lot of our heavenly attachment as well. Um, and I love the thought of God delighting in us. Mm. I just think that's such a, all that you all described earlier about what love feels like. Um, feeling like God really delights in us just takes me right to that place of feeling loved by God. So attachment. For those of you who have kids, I could ask you, when did you first fall in love with your child? Um, and probably a variety of answers. Uh, some have told me that they fell in love with their child before they were even can see just the thought of we want to have a baby and I was already forming an attachment with that child. Um, and so we know that that is how God has made us because he loved us before the beginning like we already went over earlier. Uh, so attachment, I'm not going into huge detail here because I'm ho hoping and assuming a good baseline on attachment. Um, but it's that enduring bond, it's safe, it's comfortable, it's soothing. And one of the things they characterize it is the threat of loss to, um, evokes distress. And so that's an important component. Um, and when I think about 
my relationship with God, all of those things are true too. <laughs> uh, and so that he is that place of safety, that comfort. He is that enduring. So as other human relationships are up and down, God is that foundation that, we, that I go back to. Uh, and <coughs> infant attachment, we know that it's not just basic needs. So if you're familiar with Harlow's Monkeys, uh, great YouTube videos. I love all the Harlow's Monkeys videos. You've probably seen this one. There's some with the older uh, monkeys and they're in this room. It's a really great demonstration of secure base. So really look into those if you're curious. Um, but they did a study where they had a cloth mother and a wire mother and the wire mother is the one that had the milk. And they found that the rhesus monkey would actually spend over 90% of his time on the cloth monkey. And most of the time when he needed milk would stay on the cloth monkey and try to reach over to get the milk. So this is also speaking to that fact of comfort, that it's not just basic needs, that God wired us to have a deeper level of connection and knowing with each other. And so how do we start to get that feeling that that attachment caregiver is safe or unsafe? So uh, there's lots that we can get into with memory, with like explicit memory and implicit memory, procedural implicit memory versus emotional implicit memory. We're simplifying it to our memories are from experiences which are connected to feelings of either comfort or discomfort. And that's what's stored in our brain. So if I ask you what you had for lunch three weeks ago on a Tuesday, unless that was your birthday, you probably don't remember because it's not associated with a feeling. We do tend to have a negativity bias for survival. Um, however, I think a lot of our work as Christian counselors is then in bringing joy and comfort and rewiring towards that. So still face baby experiment. We're not going to watch it. You've all probably yeah. seen it a bazillion times. If you have it, you got the link. Um, but what is good about understanding this is the concept of repair, that there can be ruptures in attachment. We can't always be emotionally available and attuned to the other people in our life. It's impossible. And so um, instead of expecting perfection, what we have to perfect is the repair. So as these things happen, as my needs become greater than the other's needs at some point, and I just don't have the bandwidth. My sign to my husband is this, and I'm like, listen, my lid's flipped. I got nothing for you. Um, so I guess it used to be talk to the hand, and now it's like talk to the flip lid. Um, and so he knows anything you attempt isn't getting through. I'm just not processing. Um, but I can repair that. Okay, thank you for giving me that moment. I'm gonna take accountability for the need to repair and do what I need to regulate, get my lid bat on, and then connect with you. Um, and so that's really what the still face to me signifies. Here in Austin, we had a great professor. She's not at UT anymore, but her parenting interventions had to do with the still face. She would do videos. Um, and what was interesting is many of you have seen this version where the baby reacts and responds and is like, come back to me. Um, in her videos, because they were parents who were struggling, abuse, neglect, addiction, all the typical things that need parenting intervention, the moms would do the still face and the baby would just kind of go along with life because that was their normal. One of the things we're seeing in the updated still face is that in kind of your um, more healthy relationships, babies are doing the same thing and it's because they've been habituated, like the shaker, to a cell phone. And so they're so used to a cell phone coming out and then basically getting a still face from mom or a lack of interaction. And so they're seeing less and less babies respond because to them they're like, oh, she's on her phone. Even though when they're actually doing it, the mom isn't pulling out her phone. The mom's going to still face and they're they're assuming the child is making that mental connection. So there's no protest. Um, yeah, and so we, we have more coming. <laughs> so we need wow. infant mental health specialists. Uh, so function of attachment, the only thing I'm really gonna highlight here, you guys know all this, is um, learning about ourselves. This is really where it comes down to, are we worthy? Do we matter? Does somebody care? Are we important? Does our voice deserve to be heard? When a parent responds to their infant or young child, they are sending all of those messages and they are creating that meaning. Um, so Bowlby started a lot of the attachment stuff. Um, and this is part of his model. Like I said, I don't want to get into too much detail on attachment. I'm hoping that you have a lot of this. Um, but with attachment and proximity and secure base, it really speaks to like this longing that we are connected with that caregiver and they are a part of our world and our need for survival. Um, so like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk 
that by it you may grow up into a salvation. So that longing, you know, God knows how, when you think about an infant who's hungry and needs to be fed, it is like, I have a need. <laughs> um, and of course, God wants us to have that same desire for him and for his word, but it's also recognizing that he has programmed that traditionally to be coming from the mom or a caregiver, um, providing that as a part of the attachment component. So that we have needs and relationships are what meet those needs and that we're innate with the desire. Uh, so then you've probably heard of Ainsworth and her studies with a strange situation. I like this, it says, I thought you were never, ever, ever coming home ever, so I panicked. Um, <laughs> the Ainsworth strange situation is really about what meaning have I made of how to get my needs met? Um, what strategies have I been taught to use to get my needs met? And, um, and then, what? so for this dog, uh, the strategy might be destroy everything, and then you come home and I get lots of attention, even if it's negative attention, mm -hmm. uh, or whatever. So the Ainsworth situation, when we're looking at it, I try not to focus on it too much diagnostically, um, even in the infant mental health world, because I don't like to get too categorized into labels. So what I boil it down to is in this parent-child relationship, as they go through their normal transitions, either state transitions or separation transitions, what is it like as they're coming and going? Uh, going? What is that flow? Um, and then what are the messages and the meaning that each are taking from it? So it says, you mean to tell me you don't go anywhere when we play peekaboo? So um, <laughs> it's not your typical separation anxiety. When we're talking about the Ainsworth separation, um, it's not falling along some of those continuums. So please know that it's a little bit different. So just because you see a child in distress separated from their parent doesn't mean they have bad attachment. You can read more about attachment styles. There's a bazillion <laughs> things, but like I said, um, although I have lots of books that I love um, on attachment, I really try to base it like in this relationship, what does this look like? Um, and keep it pretty centered. And so Samuel, uh, when Hannah is so excited to finally have her baby uh, and she's so grateful and so she tells the Lord as long as he lives he is lent to the Lord or I'll go before that therefore I have lent him to the Lord as long as he lives he is lent to the Lord I think it's interesting that she says that twice uh, because I think it speaks to that attachment of like I really really want to keep him but he's lent to you. But, okay, let me convince myself. He's lent to you. Uh, and kind of that saying it twice, I think, is kind of fascinating. Because when we think about our attachment relationships, we do have this pull to, like, oh, can we just keep them? Can they just stay here forever? Can they just stay little forever? Can they just... And um, we're constantly titrating between this codependence and autonomy and trying to figure out that healthy balance. Um, and then knowing that... What we're trying to do as Christians is how are we evoking identity in Christ, knowing that that is really the ultimate attachment that we need to be facilitating. So mirror neurons um, is really about your brain sharing the space with the other people that you're around. And so infants will pick up on our neurological states. Um, watch these videos if you need to know more about mirror neurons. But it's important to know that our mirror neurons affect our clients. And obviously, in infant mental health work, it affects their babies. Uh, this is one of the more recent scans that came out of MIT where a researcher went in with her daughter um, and they caught them kissing in the little MRI machine. They adapted the MRI machine to meet uh, both of them. And they see the brain activation around like love and attachment. And you can get into more of the research about what's actually activated. Um, but this is what mirror neurons are all about that when we are with someone in that connection, we're sharing with them. Uh, so parental mental health impacts attachment. So that's kind of a no brainer. Some of you may have heard the story of this tiger in Hong Kong whose litter um, all died. The tiger was depressed. The zoo got really creative and put piglets, which should be food, um, in there with the tiger. The mother then started eating again, started taking care of herself, took care of the piglets, anyways. Um, animal example, as you see, I love animals, for children. Um, and so this study over here is interesting. Um, they were looking at how moms were keeping up the thoughts of infant safety and well-being when separation was happening. So there were three groups. One group was normal. Uh, group two was early delivery and separation in a NICU. Group three was early delivery, separation in NICU, and likely loss. 
um, so child severe illness. And what they found is that the parents were less occupied of infant safety and well-being. They were preparing themselves, wow. themselves for the loss of the child. So a parent's mental health has huge wow. component. In the CPS cases I'm working with, if they feel like there's no hope, we're sunk. Yeah. So, you know, side note of so many other things that I'm doing is trying to get mom engaged again because that will be affecting attachment. And then I also find that moms are going around and thinking like, are you happy? Am I failing? I'm not doing anything right. I'm not present enough. And really the simplicity of children's thinking is that I love you. Like you're my perfect parent. You're who God wanted me to be with. Um, and so really helping parents battle some of that. So some of you have seen this scan before. It's thermal body scans of people experiencing different emotions. This is important, especially with infant mental health because we carry infants a lot. And so we might wanna fake it on the outside, but what we know is that an infant is actually sensing our emotional state at a different level. And we become kind of misattuned to it in older age, but infants pick up on that vibration. So if you want more on this study, if you search NPR thermal body scan, they've actually expanded this to like hundreds. And I could teach on this slide forever, but not today, because uh, we gotta keep moving but recognizing that we know that there's a visceral component to attachment. Many of you have felt the presence of God. You might be able to describe it. You might be able to even connect with it right now um, and know that it is this intangible component that has a feeling and that's part of that attachment. So we just have a little bit more infant mental health providers. So what does it mean to be a provider? I have a particular set of skills. Um, that's why I deserve a higher rate. Um, so it is a particular set of skills. None of you are able to actually go out right now and be an infant mental health <laughs> provider. There's all kinds of training, there's all kinds of education, there's lots of approaches that you need. Um, but if you're interested, infants are our most at risk population, especially in Texas. Highest rates in CPS, worst outcomes, more likely to be in long-term care, less likely to be reunited with caregiver, <coughs> biological caregivers, lots of different things. So important to know that if you're feeling called we need you. Um, how do we advocate? It's all about the relationship. So hopefully you've gotten that today, is that it's all about the relationship with the caregiver. My client isn't the child, isn't the parent. My client's the relationship. And then using a gentle approach. We were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own child. So unfortunately, I have seen nursing mothers that are not so gentle. Um, but this is what God is asking us to do when we come alongside families. How am I gently letting you know that I'm here, not in judgment, um, but in support? And we're looking for opportunities where the infant has their internal world, the parent has their internal world, and there's potential for de developmental derailment in the attachment, but there's also potential for healthy development. And so that's why we want to start early. So as each one of these happens, as development fluctuates, we know development is not linear. Um, as development fluctuates, parents aren't making the wrong meaning of what's happening. A lot of what I'm doing is observation and screening postpartum disorders, huge part of infant mental health, um, but lots of observation. What am I seeing in front of me? And then also really thinking about the Holy Spirit. I cannot tell you how many parents I've sat with from like something isn't right. They're doing all the right things, they're saying all the right things, but my spirit is unsettled. And then I have closed the door at a home visit and heard horrible things, had to call CPS, mm. had a parent throw a child against a wall, you know, trusting the Holy Spirit, um, and then knowing that there's lots of other assessments that you can get into too. In Texas, they um, require the piccolo for a lot of grants, and so um, that's an option. So I'm going to pass, well, this is Dr. Brazelton with a little infant. Um, and when we look at this infant, we might make certain meaning of how the infant looks. But what we're trying to do in infant mental health is figure out what meaning is that parent making. So this is his exchange. Dr. B says, she won't look at me directly just over my shoulder unless I give her a little more distance. Have you noticed that? Mother says, yes. I know she'll look at my face because I get eye contact when I find the right distance. I think it's just her way of regulating sensory input. And the mother says, oh, I thought she was looking for her real mother when she avoided my gaze like that. So this is actually an infant, that's a real infant, that um, was adopted at two weeks old. 
And so the meaning that this mother is making is very different than what's actually happening. This is where we're intervening in infant mental health. What is the co-constructed meaning behind the engagement together? So this is one of my home visits, but we all won't have time to watch. In essence, we're just trying to do that be with. And one of the things that is important in attachments research is earned security. You can have an attachment style that maybe wasn't a lot of your doing as a child, but you can earn a secure attachment. And that's what we're trying to do with families that we work with. How do we start to change the attachment style so that it becomes earned security for the parent and then the next generation that comes after it? Um, so you've heard of probably all the R's. This is also what you're doing when people are like, what do you do in infant mental health? This is what I'm doing. What's relational? What's repetitive? What's rhythmic? A lot of just being with, cherishing. It's the best work ever. Um, you also need to know referral resources. Here in Austin, we've got all kinds of great stuff, um, and you have that too. CPRT, which is Child Parent Relationship Therapy, now includes an infant and toddler section, which is great and good to know. Here's your mental health resources. I did want to highlight the DC 0 to 5. So the DSM doesn't really touch on infant mental health. So 0 to 3 as an organization has an entire book of categories for infant mental health. Um, they use a four-axis system, which I love because when we're talking about infants, it's not just an infant in a disorder. You have to be looking at the psychosocial system, the multi-generational effects, and that's a part of all four axes that you're going through and assessing. Really, really good. There's questionnaires in it. You can get a digital version. Um, and zero to three is the best journal I get on infant mental health. It is one every time it comes in my inbox, I look and see what the latest research is. So highly recommend that. We have a perinatal coalition here, which is great for resources on um, perinatal. First three years is our accrediting organization in Texas. Um, so with infant mental health, we have to talk about all kinds of things. <laughs> but what's most important is that, for I will restore health to you and heal you <coughs> of your wounds, says the Lord. This is really what it is. And so, um, especially for little infants, they're not the cause of their wounds. Um, but we can be a catalyst for the healing of the wounds. So this is my last video. Thank you all for hanging in there. <laughs> <laughs> stress state, that child mm -hmm. would not have saw, soothed. Mm -hmm. So us being aware, us helping parents recognize, I'm flipped, I need to come back down. Recognize, I can do this, I have confidence. This child was meant for me, we are connected, God preordained this. Being able to pick up that baby and then just see the delight 
and the wonder, he just perfectly exemplifies that attachment, that confidence, that security, all the words that you all said in love, and no words, but in being. And that's really what it comes down to. Um, and the soul felt its worth from Old Holy Night. I really feel like that's what God wants for us, particularly in infant mental health, that my main goal is that little ones, big ones, everyone I'm working with has this sense when they walk away from our engagement that they're worthy and mainly uh, worthy of God's love and his care for them and hopefully having that reflected in my work with them. The end. Yeah. There's tons of references. Um, like I said, you guys can you know, I'm happy to stay if anyone has questions. Oh, oh, yeah. Is there a website for that video? I, I use that.